Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, Scott Carson, your host, to be here. And got a special treat on this episode of the podcast out to everybody out in Note Nation, uh, all our listeners domestically and internationally. And I am honored and excited to have my oldest friend and a distinguished attorney who is uh, just an amazing guy and done some amazing things as well in his life. Uh, and he's the host of a gr- amazing and hot new podcast called The Bird Chronicles as well. Uh, join us all the way from Beaumont, Texas, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jason Bird. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks for having me, Scott. That's uh, quite an auspicious introduction. I, uh, that's a nice to say anything, anything any, anybody said about me uh, in a long, long time. So. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it. I, I, it's been a long time since I've been anybody's tree, but uh, you know, from a world internet famous guy like you, I'll take it, bud. Oh, uh, come on now. What, one of the things that uh, Jason and I have been friends since we were uh, before the summer of our fourth grade year, right, Jason? We were about nine. Yeah, nine years old. Nine years old. Yeah, exactly. And we both, uh, you know, small town Ingleside, Texas. We're Ingle Dinks from Ingleside, as we like to say. There's about 3,500 people we were there. My dad owned the local hardware store, Ingleside Hardware. Your family owned uh, the local car lot, Bird yeah. Automotive. And, uh, you know, who knew that this small kid comes skipping into the hardware store to buy some nuts and washers and talking trash. Uh, <laughs> still be friends to this day. Golly, it's hard to believe, you know, what, 33, 34 years ago? Yeah, it's been uh, something like that, man. We're getting old. <laughs> we're both getting old definitely so why don't you share a little bit about you know kind of what you do and, and what you're doing you're, you're kind of your main main gig out there yeah no um as you uh, thanks scott um i'm a lawyer obviously um and you introduced me that way and i've been a lawyer for i guess this is my 18th year so um i guess it's, it's gonna stick uh <laughs> and uh you know most of the work i do is is um you know, some of you, because I've had, I've heard you had lawyers on and y'all, y'all talking about some legal issues. Um, my practice doesn't particularly tailor and play into a lot of what you do. Um, you're a lot of your works on the business side on the back end. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I like to say I grade those guys' papers. So whenever there's a problem, uh, um, that's when I get involved. And so I do a lot of litigation. Um, it, it's hard to pigeonhole my practice. Um, uh, I, I call it commercial litigation, but within that, there's a, there's a broad spectrum of things that we do. Um, I've always done a lot of insurance litigation and what I call first party. So, uh, you know, just real simply, you've got first party claims and third party claims. So let's say, you know, I'll give you an example of a third party claim. Let's say you're driving your, your Honda and you crash into me and I'm mad and I have to sue. Well, I have to sue you. Now, I deal with your insurance company, but that's on a third-party basis, i.e. it's your insurance company. First-party claim is, uh, let's say, um, you know, I have my own insurance company and I have my own claim and and I make a claim and I'm not happy with the outcome or they don't treat me fairly or whatnot. And and so most of my practice insurance-wise involves all lines, um, but involves first-party claims. Um, I like that particularly for a variety of reasons. Uh, Number one, to oversimplify, this is oversimplifying, but generally in a third party context, insurance company doesn't have to treat you fair. They owe you no duties. They can lie to you. They can do whatever. Um, On a first party basis, you paid for that that product. Uh, They have to treat you fair. And so when they don't, the avenues available under common law and, and under the statutory structure, at least in Texas and not every state, but most states allows for a little more leverage, some leverage points. So we've got that um, and then do um, other things. I call it uh, fighting with the government, you know, and that's pretty broad. And um, most people's got a view of, well, the government does something, you know, I can use legal process to, to fix it. Not always that easy. Uh, you know, typically uh, the government uh, operates under a, a, this, this, this uh, not thought, but under the structure of sovereign immunity. Mm-hmm. That goes back to, you know, the English system and the king, you know, and it means the king can do no wrong. Right. And that still applies today. 
um, the government's immune from anything unless they say they're not. And, and, and most notably, those are constitutional issues. You know, um, one big one we're dealing with right now is, um, are some eminent domain cases. So I can't, as a government, I can't come take your property um, unless I have a public reason to do so. And if I do so, I have to pay you fairly. You know, and that harkens back to, you know, taxing colonists for tea and shit like that. Oh, sorry, I probably can't curse on your podcast. No, nope, we're fine. You can drop it. It's good. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to, I won't gratuitously, but, you know, you know me. Uh, it may seem like I'm doing that. Uh, but, you know, it goes back to taxing people on tea and not giving them representation and things like that. So we deal, we deal with that. And then, and then sometimes there's uh, other constitutional issues that deprive people of life, liberty, ability, uh, happiness. And, and so we have, um, I actually have a, a pretty interesting case going right now on one of those um, where I've got a, it turns out I, I have a client who was sexually assaulted by a police officer. Oh, wow. Deputy. Um, and and uh, as it has come out, it, um, this ain't his first rodeo. Wow. Yeah. And, and since we kind of got a little, uh, a little notoriety on the case and a little bit of uh, news coverage locally, um, I have probably, it, I know it's over a dozen other victims have come forward and contacted us. Man. And then just to add to the story, you know, he's been this deputy for, you know, seven, eight, nine years. Um, he worked as a prison guard before and a preacher on the side as well. His previous co-workers and, employee, and, and employers in both the church and uh, in the prison contacted me. He's like, oh, let me, I got a story to tell you. So, oh my goodness. Unfortunately, I think the guy's been on a, on a tear for a while. You know, we'll fight it out in federal court and, and, and go from there. So a little bit of that. And then, you know, I've gotten to where I don't handle as much volume as I used to. And so a little more selective. And then, so I've got a lot of business disputes and, and, and um, that just fall under commercial litigation um, that I do for, you know, people I like or people I want to help or, or, you know, things like that. So, and then a little bit of personal injury, but not much, you know, uh, it tends to be fairly significant situations and not a high volume. Um, so at a cocktail party, that's a long answer. <laughs> So usually I define it by what I don't do. Uh, I don't do uh, criminal law and I don't do family law. And that helps because at the cocktail party, everybody wants to ask you about their divorce or their child support or, hey, I got this ticket or some kind of crap. And, and I just, you know, man, I do this all day. I don't want to talk about your problem. That, that frankly, I, the, my, the, my knowledge of it is, you know, I got a, some buddies who do it or, you know, right. I, I remember that 20 years ago on the bar exam, but, you know, I, I'm not the guy. You, you, you know, you, if you're fighting over your China or your visitation, don't call me, man. <laughs> and I can do it, but that's the flip of it too. Is if it, you know, for people are, oh, I really want you to handle this. I said, well, bring me fifty thousand dollars and I'll look at it. Uh -huh. Look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, I'm not joking. I mean, if I'm gonna have to do something I really don't want to do, you're gonna have to pay up front. And when that's over, we'll you know, have to bring some more. And that usually quells most of it. <laughs> Interest. Isn't that terrible? No, it's not. But that's one of the things that I, I, I love about that is you've grown your firm and you've kind of got the point like, hey, I want to focus on my bread and butter. I want to focus on the stuff and I want to help people. I'm glad to help people. You know, we uh, when you had me on your podcast a few weeks back, you talked about that. Hey, if you got a friend, something like that, it's in your, your realm. You're glad to, hey, let's sit down. Let's talk. Let's see if there's something that makes sense. And we'll go from there as long as it's kind of in your, your, your wheelhouse. But you don't want to be the, the do all be all to everybody because you've you know, you, you've worked your butt off done some amazing things and uh you know let's focus on what we can't what we you know our sweet spot is and, and, and stick all to right. that versus trying to be a jack of all trades attorney right well and it's it's the same in your industry and, and, and frankly in life is general i can't be i can't be all things to all people mm -hmm. and, and and once i realize that and stop trying to do that then you know things are better um i've got a much smaller firm now i mean i got as big as we had about nine lawyers at one point and um, probably 20 staff. And, and that's, a you know, from starting on your own with just you and that's it. And then a, a part-time receptionist. Um, 
it's a big difference, you know, right. I mean, an overhead monster. Because that's the flip of it, too. If I have good people, good lawyers, good paralegals, those aren't low paid jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, those are, I mean, that's a big, just monthly nut. And, uh, and I made good money and it was great. You know, uh, I probably make about 80% of the money now, but I have a lot less drama. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. You got a couple, you got grown kids that are growing up. They're all at camp right now there in the summertime there for you. Yeah. Um, I have not missing them yet. They've been gone about a week, week and a half. Um, I'm really jealous, actually. You know, these are the time of camp. You and I didn't know this shit existed when we were kids. I mean, we were, you know, fighting at the police station or running the railroad tracks on my scooter or golf cart or a, a go kart. Yeah. I had, I had this go kart that was fast as hell, but so unreliable. And Scott was <laughs> Scott was a big kid. I mean, I mean, he wasn't as I mean, he's put on a little weight, you know, we all have with age, me too. But, but he was just a big kid at nine or 10. And he was the only one who could start that damn go-kart. <laughs> Throw uh, all the lawns that you and I mowed. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. And so I'd be like, man, I caught a close guy, and I'd have to run down there and get him and we'd go-kart around. But uh, now they're in, uh, the boys are at Camp Stewart. And my daughter is at uh, Heart of the Hills. And these are camps that are, are not far, well, not close, but not a lot closer to you than they are me. Mm-hmm. They're, um, out in Hunt, Texas, if you know where that is, um, yep. just west of Kerrville, and um, you know, I'm near the headwaters of the Guadalupe, and I mean, it's just, it's really cool out there. And they ride horses and and involved in archery and riflery and camping and fishing and swimming in the river and singing kumbaya and all that kinds of stuff. Um, but they're they're there for a month, so wow. uh, they're spoiled, yes. <laughs> uh, but you know it's a great opportunity you know because um a lot of our city kids they, they don't they don't see that anymore you know mm-hmm. um and um and i think it's good for them to be out there and they don't they don't have cell phones they don't have ipads you know if they if they you know want something like that they read a book or you know we leave them stationary and they write a letter <laughs> And, and that's lost on a lot of people today. And, and I think it's important, you know, it's, it's part of the human condition. All this technology is great, but this is new. This is not, this is not something that's, I don't think we fully, have, I think we won't, you know, as humans catch up with what it all really means until after we're way gone, you know, it, it's just, it, we're not evolutionarily tied in to use it you know, quite yet, I don't think. And um, so it makes a lot of things better and it makes a lot of things harder. I know for me, I have to really put my blinders up and it's just information overflow. Oh, yeah. I like to learn. I like to hear new stuff. But then I can become overwhelmed uh, at a moment's notice almost, you know? I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. So. Totally agree that you, you got to turn that off. You know, yeah. it, it's healthy to turn it off. You know, it's put it away, um, you know, and sometimes it's it's funny too. I've seen the joke where you've got four or five kids in a circle and they're all on their phones and they're all texting each other versus having a conversation on that stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I've seen it live in person. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. yeah, go figure. And, you know, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I talk a little trash on technology here, but then I'm over here, we're talking to you via the internet on a podcast. <laughs> go figure, right? Right, exactly. It's come a long way from us running down the street and yes you did hear correctly jason and i one time got in a fight and a scrap in front of the police station you know <laughs> at ingleside and the cop comes out is like what the hell are you doing after jason threw his bike on top of me and, and vice versa and i think i threw a rock at you uh you know small town has changed a little bit there these days we've been locked up for sure in, in juvenile hall or something like that versus just getting a scolding and a warning because they knew our parents <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't even call our folks. They threatened us, and that's but see, but that scared us, you know. Uh, I was scared of the police back then. Now I still go figure. <laughs> yeah, thank you for laughing because it was a terrible joke. But uh, but you know, we we had some respect for them, and just the fact of them taking our names and our parents' numbers. You know, we kept checking in every day. Hey, they called your mom. They called your mom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so um, mm-hmm. we lived through it, you know, we lived through it and we made it and here we are. 
Right. And yeah, Jason went off to uh, his valedictorian class, went off to Texas A&M, uh, graduated yeah, there. Since when we're in the same uh, high school class. Uh-huh. I was uh -huh. valedictorian, Scott was not. I was not the valedictorian. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not the valedictorian. I was in the top 25% of the graduating class. And uh, you had a, you had a full ride to a and I had a uh, full academic and athletic scholarship at East Texas State back in the day. And and you went on to Texas Tech and got your law degree from uh, the Red Raiders out there. Yep. Um, are you are you working? Are you mentoring anybody? You know, attorneys and stuff like that. Are you seeing or keep up with kind of what's going on with law schools and people graduating and things like that? Or not yeah, really? um, not so much with the young students because um, it's it's um, it's a little it's a little tough um, unless you have some kind of entree to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a law school in my community. There's not one. Um, there's there's a few in Houston, but that's 90 miles away. Right. Um, and so unless I already have some type of relationship with someone, um, no. Um, but but that doesn't mean I you know I'm open for it. You know I've got um, my mom carried some kid from church in here the other day and wanted me to talk to him about law school and this and that. And, and and that part of it's a little hard for me because it feels like another life ago. You know, I mean, it really does. After, I mean, it's. I mean, I've I've been out of college over twenty years. You know, it's over twenty years ago when I was taking. It's twenty five years ago almost when I was taking the LSAT and doing all that, and I, I, I have had no reason to keep up with it. So I'm not probably the best mentor there. You know, um, I know for I write a lot of letters of recommendation to A and M for good kids around here. Right. Um, and, and I stay, I stay um, tied in at a and a little bit. We, uh, we set up a scholarship about five years ago there. Um, just to kind of give back to kids, you know? Sure. And because without people doing that for me, I, I couldn't have gone to school, you know, right. or it would have been a much different situation. Um, and so I go, you know, in fact, I was there about three weeks ago you know, deal with the foundation a little bit. Um, I don't do much with tech. That's just kind of where I went to school. Plus it's in the middle of freaking nowhere. Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> and, uh, I'll say this. It was one of the better places I've ever lived simply because um, kind of just the, the personality of the community, the mm -hmm. people, got good people out there, but I attribute it to somewhat of an Island mentality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's just, you're just so isolated. You're in this basic, this desert, that's isolated from the rest of humanity and you're kind of all in it together. So, you know, but, but it was good out there. Uh, there are some, you know, some younger lawyers than me here in my community that I've gotten to be friends with, not many, but one or two here and there that I try to help out and, and I don't try and tell them what to do um, or how to do things um, because part of the beauty is figuring it out yourself, you know, um, but I try to be, if the, you know, they need a sounding board, um, um, to do that but to tell you I don't hang out with a lot of lawyers in my free time uh, kind of on purpose mm -hmm. not that lawyers are bad people but so many of them like in any industry probably caught in the rat race and they want to talk and they talk about work just gratuitously to talk about it right and I mean and, and that's part of you know you mentioned my podcast it's kind of part of my podcast is, yeah, I'm a lawyer and I know what I'm doing and I feel like I'm pretty good at it. Um, but I'm not defined by that. No, exactly. And so, you know, so to my lawyer buddies that it's, you know, if you want to talk about your case and you're just like, Hey, I got a question or, Hey, what do you think? Or let, you know, give me an, you know, I'm happy to do that all day long. Right. But if you're just going to run your mouth about some case, I don't want to hear that. I've got a, you know, a filing cabinet full of them too. You know, I don't I mean, do your job, you know? And so, um, and, and, and I think some of that too is, is just how we're trained, you know, and you sit in the law school and it's kind of a viper pit and it just, they get you geared that way. Um, and maybe I'd be better if I was more like that, but I, I just, I can't, I can't be solely concentrated on here's what I do for, for my professional life. Cause you know, um, I probably like fishing a lot more than lawyers. <laughs> that's what i was going to say you do spend time fishing and hanging with the kids but you've also got a yeah if i remember correctly you've got a rental portfolio too there in beaumont too some rental real estate investment stuff that you're you're dealing with too and so yeah. you, you've got a great mixed bag 
of things outside of uh, just being an attorney. Like you said, you're an attorney, but it doesn't define you. Yeah. And, you know, I, and, and I, but, you know, the problem with that is I say I like fishing, for example, and other stuff, but I, it feels like I never do it. You know, I'm always working. Hell, I got a big, me and my uh, best buddy, we got a big boat down in Galveston. I hadn't been on the son of a gun in over a year. Wow. You know, I've got a 54 foot hatter. It's just sitting there. <laughs> you know, geez. <laughs> you know, but, but, um, so when you guys get ready to go fishing, let me know though. I will. <laughs> we actually got it coming out of the water we're gonna have to do a bottom job on it because it's just been sitting yeah Yeah, but this fall we're ready to run that's kind of my favorite time to go offshore is because your weather's more reliable and um the fishing's pretty good you know Mm -hmm. exactly and we have been fishing quite a few times gigged a lot of fish uh fished a lot of caught a lot of flounder redfish stuff like that i drank a lot of cold beer No, and then, you know, we've got that little cabin down at the beach and, you know, we'll, I surf fish a lot when I yeah. just kind of as a throw down, just because it's easy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can work it as hard or as little as you want, you know, get out there and get after it or, or not. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's me. That's your boy. Now, now with your, uh, kind of taking us back a little bit, cause I got somebody asked a question here on online. Yeah. How would you, if you're dealing with an insurance company, uh, with your insurance company, because we deal with them all day long on either claims on, you know, especially like this time of year with the, the storms, you know, trying right. to file a claim against a roofing or especially with what we're doing in the debt space of putting insurance on it, not being able to see the interior of the property on a no deal, then foreclosing, coming inside to see stuff. What's what's the best way if you wanted to to fight what you're, you're paying for coverage, but it's, maybe they just, just decide to not do it. Is there any tips or solutions you would give the listeners out there when they're having to start a fight with their insurance company? Yeah, absolutely. First off, you, you you know, it's easy for me to say over here in the ivory tower, but you need to know the product you're getting. Yeah. And, and, um, and I see it across all sophistication levels is, um, when you're talking to that insurance agent, what do you, what do you really can into? You're keying into that premium number, you know, you're keying into that price and how it fits in whatever your model is and how yep. you have to be profitable. And so just be careful. And, you know, the lower the premium, it's not universal, but the lower the premium, the most likely the least amount of coverage. And particularly when they send you over the, and, and you all probably do it this way, I do it too, is where they email you over the e-sign stuff. Yep. Once the e-sign documents at the back, be, be wary of what you're signing because you're signing um, endorsements that exclude certain coverages and and those coverages may not be important to you or your business model, you know, Uh, you know, the, just may or may not be just know what you're excluding because um, typically those endorsements uh, take out big, big chunks of coverage um, for only a few dollars, you know, um, you know, I see it a lot and this is more in the consumer market, but I say, I'll give you an example is the animal liability. So, um, you know, for ever, most homeowners policies had an animal liability coverage. Yep. Um, and then they got to where, well, you know, we don't really want to, to do this, but we'll do it. And we'll only exclude it if it's a pit bull, you know, and then they got to where, well, it's a, it's a pit bull, it's a German shepherd, it's a chow, it's a, you know, just all kinds of stuff then we're excluding it. And then now I see a lot of policies that they're just not going to cover it. Um, and, um, you know, you got to be careful with that, you know? Um, so, but more, I, I would think your audience is a little more geared to, to um, the investment market. Right. So um, as opposed to the consumer, my, 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 my home properties. And so um, one thing to, to just consider is how the coverage works, okay? Typically, you know, and, and we saw the end of it in our careers, um, but you're not gonna see it in your market very often anymore, is it used to be what called on for property and casualty all risk policies. Most of the policies they sold were all risk. And, and what I mean by that is they generally say, we cover this property against all risks, right. except for here's the exclusions. And they would exclude, you know, terrorism or riot or whatever, you know, whatever they, they put in there. And, uh, and those are generally pretty inclusive type policies because you start from the, you, you start from the, from the baseline of everything's covered 
unless it falls into one of these little niches. Well, that's changed. That that that's it. That's I would think that type of generally that concept of all risk with most of your listeners um, is just not something that's going to fit into their their price model to make money. Because you can still get it, but it's just it, it's it, it's going to be prohibitively mm-hmm. expensive. So um, on your property and casualty, everybody's going to have name peril coverage, um, and. And um, on the name peril policy, this that the difference is they say, well, here are the things that are covered. Now they still have all the exclusionary language like before, but that's you know I'm only going to cover this. I'm only going to cover this. Now, uh, with respect to what are the real risks for the the investor, you know, with with uh, respect to insurance, um, your number one and your historical risk is fire. Most of these policies are going to cover fire. So you're probably, you know, you're safe there. So long as you're not the one who burnt the place down or, you know. You, know, <laughs> you didn't go through and try the barbecue in the, in the, in the dining, dining room. <laughs> right. They don't allow arson and things like that. Um, now, general negligence, they still allow for. I mean, if you, yeah, but if you do something, you know, that could look at, like intentional, yeah. So that's good. The one where you see, uh, there's two areas where I would think, you know, your folks, um, that, that listen to you and, and are in this, this, I say no game, but you know what I mean? The real yep. estate investment loosely. Uh, the, the real, the real risk and the insurance issues they're going to see on property and casualty are probably going to be number one, wind related. Uh, and, and that's where the folks y'all need to spend a little bit of time looking at these policies and, uh, and working with an agent who's knowledgeable, um, and if you're not sure, ask somebody else to. Um, and I've seen it particularly in the last few years on the commercial policies. Um, uh, they're getting really, really tight on what they're allowing for and what they're not. Um, I'll give you a great example. Uh, one you're seeing is on your metal roofs. If any of your commercial buildings have these metal roofs, you have, you have some endorsements that most of the major carriers are adding that disallow for marring, scratching, damage. Um, but they're using it very broadly and as a sword. So, and, and there's a couple of endorsements floating out there that some are tighter than others, okay? Um, I like the ones that are a little more open because then I can work with them. Right. I've got a client actually right now and he's got he's got property everywhere, but he's got some, some uh, pretty big structures um, outside of San Antonio. And a big kale swarm comes through, and and his roofs are beat to hell. Now, his issue with it, most likely, is um, I would think is he's a real estate investor. He's built these places. He's gonna, he's you know, he's kind of mixed in with other pools, that, and basically, he's gonna hold them five to eight years, and he's gonna flip them. The roofs generally are performing. I mean, there's a few leaks here and there. But they look terrible. I mean, they. I mean, they're really, really, really beat to hell. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got a new policy right before this. Didn't really pay much attention to it. Blah blah blah. And he's got this exclusionary language that mm-hmm. the company's saying, hey, we're not paying you for it." Well, you say, "Big deal." Well, to replace those roofs, it's a million dollars. It's a million dollars of roofs, and it's not because it's a fancy roof. It's just a big place. Yeah, right. Of several buildings, and so. Now he's left with over, you know, probably a couple of hundred dollar savings that, you know, his agent just slapped it in there and he didn't really talk about it and didn't really look at it, that now he's going to take the loss at some point unless I can basically weasel some coverage for him. Um, and, and the loss may not be, you know, a million dollars at the sale, but it may cost him half a million, mm-hmm. or four thousand. you know, I mean, it's, and it's one of these things too, if you're going to buy that big, a big, big, you know, that big, a property um if the roof alone cost is a million dollars i mean someone's going to boots on the ground go look at that place yeah and what's the first thing you're going to tell you well they're going to beat you up saying hey man this roof's all beat to hell and whether it is is or it isn't it sure looks like it right yeah that's the truth you know yeah. and so that you're going to have to deal with it and and so i tell people um you know i use that example it's like when we have a case of litigation this isn't right and, you know folks get fired up and especially when it's your business and people are feel you know you feel wrong so look you gotta start stop worrying about what's right and what's true 
So when we go down to the courthouse, it's not about what's true. It's about what looks true. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same thing. You know? Well, that the roof might be performing, but sure, sure as hell doesn't look like it. Well, you're taking a hit if you want to sell it. Okay. So that's the first area and that's general. And, you know, obviously, I mean, I answer questions about this all the time. So I'm always sure. happy. If you got people with specific questions, I'm happy to answer. I'm not going to charge them anything. I'm happy to point them in the right direction. Uh, the second area that, you know, I would think your listeners, i.e. note, note investor, real estate investor type folks need to watch is the water related coverage. Mm -hmm. um, because those are the types of things that can, you know, a small loss can, can really grow on you. Um, and, and uh, some of the investor type policies, um, depending on what state you're in and what form you're using, um, are, are pretty limited in the resulting damage. Um, and you just, and I'm not saying, you know, you need to go get insurance that covers everything. You just need to know what you're working with. Mm -hmm. You know, you just got to know what you're working with. Uh, because in some areas for some losses, you know, if, if you're in the, you know, if you buy a bunch of beach houses in Galveston, I mean, your wind coverage is going to be crazy. It's not going to be the same thing at your house in Austin, you know, and, and that that's going to affect your, your, your bottom line. You know, you're going to have to buy that one real cheap, you know, depending on, or you're going to have to self-insure or, you know, depending on what it is, you know, I've seen folks get stuff out of non-traditional markets out of London and other places. And there's, there's all kinds of ways to skin a cat. And particularly in the in the in the commercial, when you start getting into apartments and multifamily and things like that, uh, there's ways to layer your risks that bring down your premiums, and and you see that fairly commonly, that that they're basically the insurance companies are collateralizing their risk, and you know they're putting together a big pool, and there's layers of it. Right. In in the in I mean, I'm not getting into the technical terms, but basically, you know. Scott Carson insurance has 15% of the first layer and Jason bird has 20% and, and, and they spread that risk. But the markets worldwide are so big, they can do that and still make a bunch of money and they'll have no risk, but it ultimately does somewhat help drive the price down for the investor crowd, you know, for, cause that's what you're worried about. Look, you don't want to get into something when the carry cost is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> yeah. We've I've had some friends that bought some stuff in uh, Florida that have uh, on the you know, on the water that were in in, in hurricane great deals, great deals, great yeah. deals. But the insurance is killing them, and they didn't didn't really check that out that much until they actually closed on the deal. They didn't do the right due diligence on the front end. So that's a that's a big thing for people out there. Take a look at what you know. You should be talking to an insurance agent before you're closing, or have somebody who's handling your coverage, making sure, hey, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to protect against this and. And just not yeah, and you off. get a feel for that with experience, you know. Sometimes you got to get burned. Yeah, but it's crazy, you know. I'll give you an example. I've got we we have got a little cabin down at the beach. It's nothing fancy. I mean, it's nicer than anything we probably grew up in, but it's nothing fancy, you know. Three bedroom, two bath house, you know, elevated down on the beach. Um, it's maybe fourteen, fifteen hundred square feet. I mean, like I said, it's not much. Insurance is seven, eight grand a year. Wow. And that's that's high for that size of house. Yeah. You know? Uh, hell it might be more. I don't know. I have to ask Christy, but um <laughs> it's sad, but you know. Uh and then taxes about the same. So I mean it's you know, just the for a personal carry of that little cabin, you know, it's fifteen hundred a month. Mm hmm You know, just out the box. Yeah. Taxes and insurance. Not to mention the stuff in town, you know, so got to keep working. Got to keep working, brother. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a important numbers to look at because it's, you know, it's not always the first thing that we're looking at when we're looking at assets. You know, we get excited about sometimes seeing cities, you know, I love, I love Florida like the rest of them, but specific areas have been hit hard. Uh, I guarantee insurance in Daytona Beach is a lot more expensive these days than it was a, a few well, years I mean, back. Really statewide in Florida is going to be a tough market. They don't like it. It's the wind and it's a tough market. Um, Texas is a, no, it's t can be difficult too, you know, um, because of its vastness and its look. They they know how to underwrite and they know their risk on fire. Like yeah. I mean, they've got that figured out. They they know what instant rate per you know million dollars of insurance they're going to have for fire. 
I mean, that's thousands of years. We got that figured out. What they can't gauge is the wind. You know, they just don't know. And, and you'll have freak deals and, you know, windstorm, you know, over Big Ben. Who cares, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, or how about take a Cat 4 hurricane up the ship channel in Houston? Yeah. Are, that's the big, you know what I mean? You could have the same amount of wind, but that's, that's, that's a disaster. Yeah. And that's, that's not, that, that has worldwide implications in that market, you know, in the insurance market. So, so to hedge against that, well, you know, you're going to pay these premiums. I think California has got similar issues, you know, and it's these places that have, they have just the hard risk to gauge. You don't know when you're going to have a fire out there. You know, you don't, you know, when you're going to have a hurricane come across the Gulf, you know, you don't, you don't know these things. So um, I try to personally buy as little insurance as possible. Uh, and, and, and part of that's just because I'm so skewed, you know, I mean, for years and years, you represent people who have problems with carriers and, and you see, you know, they may call it outliers, but I, I see some bad behavior and I've just got a skewed view, you know? I, now, that being said, I never typically have too many problems with my personal claims, you know, but, but I know what, I know what to do about it too. You know, I've got leverage points um, that others don't. Um, it, Cause that's the last, when you're in business, if you're dealing with me, you're not going forward. You know I mean? If you're dealing with me, you got a problem. And, and ultimately, we try to fix it for folks, but but you don't want to be there. You want to avoid those problems at all costs. So uh, by knowing what coverages you have, it also can help you to present it in the most light, the light most favorable to you. Because make no mistake about it. There's a reason. There's basically, you know, three parts of any insurance company. You got the advertising, marketing, agent guys give me your money and then you got the investment guys okay we got the money let's go make money with the money then you got the claim people and they're the redheaded stepchild that nobody wants to give them the money and and when it's in their hands make no mistake about it they're not your friend they're looking to reduce liability for the carrier i mean that's their job yeah you know? and they do it every day and so you know if you present something you know, and it may seem innocuous, you know, you, you're just being, but just the words you use, the vernacular you use, it, you know, it's like talking to the cops. It can and will be used in you. <laughs> yeah. you characterize a loss in, in a way that, that then tends to lead towards no coverage. Um, and, and I've even seen that trend in my career become more aggressive. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, the claims process wasn't quite so aggressive, but it's, it, they're aggressive, particularly with, you know, real estate investors are sophisticated people. You know, you're going to be held to a to a higher standard, if not technically legally, just by perception, than you know Joe Blow with, you know, homeowner's policy. Yeah, that's definitely the truth in different areas too. We've we've experienced that personally. You know, having assets in Chicago. You know, in in, in the wrong side of Chicago or vacant properties. That, you know, you've got to you pay through the roof or and you're still not going to get a lot of, there'll be a lot of exceptions, a lot of clauses in there for you to get the full coverage that you need for either vandalism or fire. Or, well, particularly on the vacancy, you know, typically you're allowed 60 days. Yeah. And without some type of, you know, it's a, it can be a little different on your commercial properties, but, you know, you, there's some notice requirements and you can extend those times. But a lot of people don't know that. I mean, you know, 62 days in, someone comes in and steals all the copper, um, I mean, breaks out the sheetrock steals all the copper out of the building, the structure. And that's, that's a big dollar fix. Yep. And that's not a place you want to be. Um, and saying, well, it's been vacant, uh, uh, uh you know, and, 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 and they're going to have those clauses in every policy you'll have, yep. you know, so just, you know, and it's sometimes you gotta learn the hard way, I guess, but, but I'd rather your folks not learn the hard way. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> You don't want to go through the school of hard knocks and try to learn it as you go on that stuff. You want to know because we've had that happen a few times. Copper got stolen from one property three times in a row. Yeah, yeah you got it. And watch that. I guess watch the copper market, right? When <laughs> copper prices get high, you better just lock your stuff up, man. Yeah, that's the truth. Crackheads are coming for you, copper. <laughs> hey, I've had it happen at the office. Uh, 
out of our, I had to put a cage around our AC units. Yeah. I had to get in there and pull the copper tubing out of the AC units. I've got this old house. I've told you about it. It's where we lived for a long time. And uh, now we moved five years ago, but I still own the damn thing. Ugh, anyhow. So <laughs> if, if anybody out there has any interest in a 5,000 square foot, three bedroom, two bath house in historic district in Beaumont, Texas, give me a call. <laughs> There's no interest, but it's a beautiful place. It's cool. But uh, it's got this roof structure. It's pitched at the top of the big part, and then it comes down um, to a flat, like valley area, like a big rectangle on, on the top that has, uh, I call them floor drains, but drains in the, in, in the room that then go down through the structure and back out down the brick, down these huge drains that, you know, come down the side of the house, these gutters. Well, they're all copper. Old lady who built the house, house had more money and she knew what to do with it. And they're all copper. And uh, now they've been there for 65, 70 years. And um, so they're green. And, you know, unless you know what you're looking at, you don't realize it. But I used to think, man, I hope these crackheads don't figure out that these are copper trains, man. I'll, I'll be climbed up on this house with crowbars, pulling that copper off. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> no, no one's got to them yet, you know. Um, but see, there's more copper all over that place. <laughs> and then on the on the uh, what are the caps on the on the fire on the uh, fireplaces? That's all copper. I mean, wow. the lady had copper all over the place. <laughs> it's a crackhead's night, a uh, wet dream when it comes. To- <laughs> yeah, man. Like, stay away. Stay away. It's a cool. It's a cool house though. Um, liked being there. It just didn't fit us for a while. You know, a lot of space. Did you run into any issues with it being a historical property on what you could and could not do to the, the property? You had to keep it pretty clean and, and keep yeah, it. Yeah, they have um, they have some restrictions. It's like a whole neighborhood, the old town district, or mm-hmm. they, they have some restrictions, and you're supposed to go through approval to do stuff. But I mean, I, I ask forgiveness, not permission, typically. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, that's my damn house. But I never did anything crazy. You know, when I came and do things, I, I I was consistent with, you know, how it looks. But I never did a lot. Although, right before we moved, I had a I had a designer come up with an addition. Um, you know, I was told my wife we had rich white people problems. <laughs> you know, we had this big old house, but we had more kids than we planned. <clears throat> and, um, and so they were just getting older and they're all sharing a bathroom and all this and and so we're going to add on the bottom. Um, and I would have had to gone through a pretty extensive um, approval process, right? With them. But they're not as bad as you in that district as you see. Like, for example, in Houston in the Heights, my brother-in-law lives in the Heights. And uh, he bought he bought this house years ago. Uh, um, I don't know, 15 years ago. And he went in single. It was like 800 square foot, tiny little, two tiny bedroom, one bath house. And then he got married and they popped out a couple kids and they were still living there, man. It just wasn't, it wasn't doing the trick, but uh, all around him, it's kind of funny is that, you know, there's been this revitalization of this neighborhood that's yeah. inside the loop. I mean, it's just off of downtown and it's a neat neighborhood too. So you have these huge places now are built up all around. It. And uh, by the time he went to do the same thing, he had to go through their, their historic district and it took him a long time long time i think it took him like a year and a half to get approval wow get this stuff yeah. you know those kids are getting big in that time frame in a year and a half <laughs> yeah oh yeah and then they did the construction so i think it was i think it was a challenge for them but they got a great place in, in a great neighborhood now so you know it'd be the kind of place that just to come in and buy would be probably prohibitively expensive for them. yeah yeah exactly now <clears throat> As we get getting closer to the end here, what is uh, you and I have both gone different routes than probably expected out of uh, high school and, and, and different things. And, and I think we've both <clears throat> done very good for ourselves yeah. out there and, and, and done some amazing things out there. What's been one big one thing that you've done since graduating and going through college that really just kind of stands out that you're excited about and uh, proud of looking well, I'm back? I'm really happy. I've never, I've never been to prison. Yeah. Uh, I said that jokingly, but there's some sincerity to it. Um, I mean, I've been to jail a few times, but never prison. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't count those one night stays. Yeah. Um, <laughs> same here, brother. Same here. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, 
you know, more recently, I, I would say it's, it's, it's some realizations and it's, it's coming to understand, um, my strengths and my weaknesses, mm -hmm. you know, working on those things, um, and, and trying to keep an open mind because the world is changing around us. Yeah. And at a paces at which, I mean, it's always been this way, society changes, things happen. At paces at which that I think are faster than have been in the past. I, I really do. And, and what I, example I use for that is I say, uh, my childhood, upbringing, culture, society around us, for me and you, is I think more akin to our parents than our kids to ours, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. You know, I, I just... You know, our, our world was a little different than our parents. It's all these kids and this rock and roll and whatever. But but our kids is it's just more dramatic. So um, so 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 it's not something I've done. It more that it's just been been trying to to be mindful of who I am and who I want to be. Um, and, and I've been working on that. And, then, and part of that comes to a realization that. Yeah, you know, look, I always try to take care of everybody, but I got to take care of myself too. And so I've been working on that too. And, and, um, you know, in, in part of keeping that open mind and, and working on me, that's, that's part of why I do the podcast. You know, I mean, I don't know what the hell I'm doing with my podcast, you know, and, and I'm not trying to make any money off of it. I'm not going to get clients off of it. And it's not my goal. You know, I mean, it's not my hustle or I'm not going to do some fucking mastermind of let me teach you about insurance law. I mean, look, it's just a way for me to try and it, express myself a little bit. Yep. Talk to folks that I like and I, and I want to, I want to uh, magnify them or learn more about what they're doing um, and try and have a little fun doing it. So uh, it, it's really that, that, that goal of me trying to just, just to, to really make myself better at that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's what I'm doing is because it's 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 not a you know I used to think oh I'm going to do this I'm going to get these cases and make all this money and I, you know and, and I'll be I'll be happy or I'll be good and it doesn't work that way you know it was it's sad news it doesn't work that way you know I mean wherever I go I'm there and so you know I I, I, I I've, I'm starting to find I have a little more um, peace by by working on me at the same time as I'm doing these other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been going to yoga. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that, Bird. We've been, we've, I'm we've, built like a can of corn, man. I'm built ago. like a can of corn. I mean, it's, you know, that's it. that yoga's hard. <laughs> that's good for me. You know, it's yeah. good for me to, to, to challenge myself with those things. Yeah. And, and also, you know, learn my limitations. Mm -hmm. Hey, I can do something, but I don't need to be spending my time doing that. I can handle your divorce case, but I, I'm not, I just, you know, pick, pick, it's, it's, it's pick, a really pick my lane and stay with it. <clears throat> That's a powerful lesson. I think, I, and we deal with that all, all the time. I'm talking to people, what about this? What about this? I'm like, listen, just find what you enjoy, find what you're good at and stay in your lane. You don't have to try that. It, it is good to learn new things or nothing against that, but if you find yourself running all over trying to, do everything you're not going to be happy you're going to burn yourself out from burning the candle at both ends and you're not going to find happiness in the long run it's going to be difficult and you know i'm happier now doing less than i was doing a couple of years ago right. and being more focused i know you are i mean we've had this conversation a couple of times about things and that's it's a that's a powerful message for those that are listening out there if you find yourself unhappy because you're, you're probably doing too much and you just need to focus on you know cutting back to one or two things at the max and you know and challenge yourself that that way right and you know I'll give you an example. 20 years ago, if you'd have told me, hey, you're going to be regarded as probably, you know, maybe not the expert, but an expert in insurance law in the state of Texas, I laughed at you. I mean, God, that sounds so awful and boring. And it's, you know, one of these things when you're young, you kind of fall into stuff and then you, you have a little success at it and then you just run with it. Now I've done it so long. I mean, I've probably had three, four, five thousand 5,000 first party insurance cases, just those kind of cases. I've been lead counsel, I've done hundreds of millions of dollars in litigation just on coverage. Yeah. Um, and it sounds so boring and, and it can be, but you know, I'm not, 
you know, I used to always think, oh, go to school, go to college, get educated, do good. And I'm entitled to some type of this feeling of the glamour. What do you mean glamorous, man? You know, it's not. And I have bad days. I have shitty days sometimes. Yep, same here, brother. It's sometimes, you know, my goal is to, I just try to have more good days than I have bad. And if, and if, and I still, I think, I still think I have that in my profession, in my professional life. Um, and if I can keep it there, then that's good. If I get to a point to where I'm not having, I'm having more bad days consistently than good days, then I, maybe I need to look at doing something else. Yeah. You know? I agree. Yeah. That's a good, gets, that's a good word of advice for everybody out there. Cause it's, we all have ups and downs and a lot of people just like to see the ups. They don't recognize the downs out there. And no matter what you're as an entrepreneur, business owner, you have your share of bad to go. That makes the good even more sweeter. As they say, the, the juice is worth the squeeze when, yeah. you, when you go through the good and the bad in there. It's like y'all, you what? You want to call this line of credit? Do now? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> give me a minute. You know, I mean, there's, there's challenges, you know, there's challenges. Um, yeah. But um, that's how we, it's how we respond to those challenges in our personal, professional life, or, or any walk of life that really defines us. Exactly. And, uh, and love, love that stuff. Them. I mean, you've had them, you know, you've had plenty of challenges. I've watched you over the years. I've, I've seen you have them. I've seen you think, oh, this is the next best thing. And then eh, six months later, maybe not so much. Exactly. Exactly. It's, but, uh, but you've, wor- you've learned from it. And that's one thing I'll say about you too is, um, you know, you're open to learning from those things and, uh, and you've, and if nothing else, you know how to put your head down and work, I mean, you know, and I, and I think that you'd even admit that that has brought you through a lot of challenges, if nothing else, because by God, I'll just work through it. Well, at least I'll outwork them, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and yeah. that, you know, that, that's a lot. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, 80% of the battle, 90% of the battle, just show up, just show up, you know, show up and put some work in, you know, there you go. And, and I think that's a good lesson. I don't, you know, for any, any profession. Now that alone is not going to get you there. Right. But, but, um, but that's, 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 that's half the game and showing up and just putting, putting the hours in and, you know, keep your head down sometimes and then just, and just keep plugging forward. That's the only thing sometimes that you can do. To, to make now, sure. I have a question kind of related to that for your business is um, how do your relationships, your professional relationships um, affect your actual business practice? I mean, it, it, is that relationships across the country? Is that how you get get your deals or, or how does that work? So, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's still a relationship business. Um, I find, especially uh, Steph and I were talking about this the other night, that we have a, a lot more closer relationships with people outside of Texas, outside of our hometown than we do locally because we've traveled. We've spent so much time in the last few years at events, speaking at conferences and, and our, you know, some of our best friends uh, are, are just people that are all across the country, look, you know, entrepreneurs that we've spoken with and hung out with. I mean, we've got some local friends here in town that aren't in what we do, but yeah, it's, it's a relationship business. I mean, some of my best friends have, have come from the note business and vendors and things like that we hang out and shoot the breeze with, but it's also too, um, you know, those, and I'm sure it's like you, you, you reach those peers that go through ups and downs. And those are the people you reach out to when you are facing struggles and, and, um, you know, troubled times or dealing with trying to figure out what's, what's the next story or what's the next Avenue for you as you're going through things. Cause everybody goes through stuff. You know? Yeah. And I, and it was interesting to ask you that because that's one thing I, I uh, mistake I made early in my career, I took for granted or didn't appreciate. And, and what I mean by that is I never felt like, um, you know, as a young man, anybody had done anything for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt like, you know, I didn't, no one in my family had gone to college. I went to college, went to law school. Um, and I went to law school with, you know, a bunch of kids who were set up, you know, their daddy was a judge or was a lawyer or had this connection. You know I mean? They, and they had to go show up and do the work, but they were on easy street. Yeah. I, I had to graduate with honors and get on the law review and do that. So, cause I needed someone to give me a job. Yeah. You know, and I did that. And, and, um, and, uh, 
got a great opportunity down here with a good size firm and it was miserable. But I stayed, I stayed three years, frankly, because they invested in me and I felt like I owed them. I owed them. And so when I got to a point where I knew they had made money not lost on me, then that's when I would laugh. Sure. And, and when I left, they laughed at me. You know, they said, well, what big firm are you going to? Are you going to Houston, going to Fulbright, going to this? So now I'm going on my own and they laughed. Yeah. You know, I didn't have any business or any money or no, and no prospects for any of it. And, and so I always had this me against the world attitude, um, which was, which is very good in many respects because it, it would, it drives me. But um, with, you know, a little bit of age as I've come to appreciate, you know, it, it doesn't have to always be that hard, you know. There are good people out there that will work with you and that will help you. And, and I just, you know, first 10 years, I didn't appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And, and really, if I have anything to look back on, I'd say, yeah, I probably could have done a lot better at that. I, I'd echo that. Relationships I- and being open to helping others and more, more importantly, receiving help and advice and asking for it. Yeah. Well, but I would be willing to bet though that, uh, Hey, laugh at you was probably one of the biggest driving factors to prove, prove them wrong. Cause I know I went through the oh, same, yeah. same yeah. thing. They helped. Oh, you can't do that. Whatever. Good luck with that. Good luck on your own. And that was one of the biggest driving factors to get to me where I'm at today. And I know it's one of the biggest driving factors to get you where you're at today too. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, man, I like the I like the new window uh, <laughs> you got going on. Is that a new thing? Yeah, we're switching. We switched offices, and we got some new background stuff. I'm up a little higher, bigger office as we kind of uh, change some things up a little bit here with what we're doing for the podcast. And so my green, the, the green monster wall behind it. Some yeah. people are still getting used to it, but we're uh, tweaking it up and and uh, making the changes. I'm in, in the process of bouncing between two offices throughout the day. So that's that big, you know, that big city money now. I like uh, it. I wish that was the case, but yeah, we're, well, we're so doing only well. a little bit. I know you got to go, but I want to, I want to, uh, you, you've had a, a lot of success on your podcast. Tell me, tell me how many countries and what, which, what all you got going on. So we able to talk to you and I wanted to, I wanted yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Now we, uh, we've got, we're in like eight, we had, we got a uh, listeners in eight over 85 countries, um, out there that, are registering with the iTunes and things like that. We're, we're going to hit 300 and you probably hit 400,000 downloads in the next 30 days. Um, being on different radio stations across the country, we've got over a million, million and a half hits to the radio station website for our episodes, which is really exciting. So it's, okay. it's, it's been, we're got to hit our 500th episode here, the first part of August. So kind of crazy that, uh, just showing up every day and putting the time in. That's, and- that's so much different than mine. Well, um, yeah, hey, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, you know what, brother? I, I love it. You're starting it. Everybody's got a different story, different thing. Ours is obviously focused on the note game and, and it's, it's, it's taken over some of the things that we used to do. So it's actually become a lot easier to consolidate, but I love your, your, your podcast. I love the episode of your son. I love it. You had with Wendy Davis on, yeah. um, and you had the, I don't know if it's out yet. I haven't listened, but you had the big, uh, big uh, interview with somebody what was the Senator. I can't remember what her name was. Yeah, we're, 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 we're still trying to get that set up. It's not out. Okay. Um, you know, these people running for president, they, they can be difficult. So, um, but now we're, I'm having fun with it. You know, I've got, um, you know, I, I had a friend come on and we talked about a work-life balance, you know, and um, she's pretty awesome. She's, you know, she's a fitness model, a, um, what all does she does? She does modeling. She's like a trainer and she's, she's got three kids, little kids and um, is a full-time lawyer too. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, Jesus, how do you do all this? Let's, that's what I wanted to talk about. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and I've had a, I had a, a buddy, he's an insurance agent. We wanted to talk about insurance, but he's also an MMA fighter. Like wow. MMA fighter. And so we talked about MMA the whole time, you know, <laughs> and, uh, he's trying to go to him to, you know, a couple more fights. Um, and cause I don't think it's, wife and family like him fighting it anymore you know and um i've got a i've got a buddy coming on tomorrow um i hadn't seen him in years he runs a group in austin though um, called texas watch and um it's kind of a consumer advocacy group and so try to get things that loosely touch on law because yeah. i mean it, it, that is my lane i get it but um but try to really try and spin it into hey here are these interesting people um here's here's what they do but 
but how the legal aspects touch across, you know, life in general and everyday life. And so some of them are a little more going to be a little more legal in nature, you know, and then some of them, like the one with my kid was, that was the most fun. Yeah. It's a handful, isn't he? <laughs> he reminds me a lot of you as a young and Correcting me and he's, you know, I'm like, geez, boy. But, um, but he's passionate, you know, he's 11 years old and he's passionate. Um, and so that's, that's the fun thing is to talk to folks who are passionate, um, about what they do because that makes it interesting you i mean you turned me on to a guy the other night you had him on a friend of yours adam um uh, shabel shabel adam shabel yeah the, the phd the, the, the million the pound engineer yeah the formerly fat guy yeah uh, which i mean i I'm, i can relate to him immediately just because i'm in the middle of that you know yeah um, i've lost quite a bit of weight and uh, still got a ways to go but but uh, getting there and, uh, and, but uh, man, but he's passionate. Yeah. You know, and again, and then the other thing he was passionate and he was tough. He, you had some video where he was talking about Instagram and how to use Instagram to grow whatever your media presence. And it's like, Oh man, I am old. I didn't know. I didn't even understand half the shit he was talking about. And I was, well, <laughs> just have I your own. I guess I don't want to push my podcast that hard because I'm not doing all this crazy stuff. Totally well. fine, brother. Totally fine. You just oh, have your daughter take a look I, at it and help you. I out. just got Instagram uh, mainly because my kids are on it, I think, and or my daughter is. And um, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do this podcast. Maybe I'll get an Instagram. But I, I just, man, I don't have the energy for it, you know? You don't have to. That's the beautiful thing. You're doing great with what you're doing and it's a... Uh, uh, I love listening to it. I love listening to episodes. You're doing you're doing a great well, job, man. I'm not going to hit 400,000 downloads anytime soon. But you know what? Okay. That's the thing is I don't care. That's not what it's for. And frankly, if no one listens to it, that's fine. It's for me. It's for me yeah. to get better. You know, because I find this medium challenge. I sit and you know I can go into court and I can have my plan and you know nothing always goes according to plan. But I know what I'm talking about. I'm there, yeah. and you know I'm there in an adversarial type role. I'm there on an angle, I'm leaning on you or whatever the case may be. And, and, uh, and that's, that's fun. And I'm, you know, trained for it, geared up for it, but that's not, that's not the goal with the podcast, whether being on yours or, or me hosting it. And so I find it actually more challenging, you know, uh, it's, you know, I have to be a real human being and, you know, and <laughs> converse with people without, pushing angles and it, it gives you an opportunity to turn off that switch and I, I, I love that i mean that's the thing is when you're out traveling speaking and things like that you said in court you've got to be on yeah. you know jason bird the lawyer scott carson the guy. and i like the fact of having conversations with very interesting to be myself like this one like this one this has been one of my favorite ones because it's just just two guys visiting and that's what sure. i miss a lot of the times absolutely and um we even talked about insurance hopefully um your folks <laughs> um helpful you know totally helpful totally helpful um, well and, and seriously if you or your folks ever have you know random insurance stuff um i'm happy to I, look i answer questions all the time sure i give stuff away all the time all right what's the best way for them to reach out to you? just go to the website uh, the yeah, bird law firm depends on, you know yeah the bird law firm um you can search me that way i it comes up it's been up for a while but but it's txbyrd.com uh it's the shortest way I could use my last name. And, yeah. you know, and Bird, for those that are listening, is B-Y-R-D, not wow. B-I. It's B-Y-R-D, the Bird. And then you can also yeah. check out his podcast, listen to it, subscribe to it, give him, uh, you'll love the episodes, the Bird Chronicles on any podcasting platform out there for you. Yeah, so. it's out there. Yeah, I call it the Bird Chronicles. And I think we've got a website up too, thebirdchronicles.com. Awesome. Um, and kind of the taglines where law meets life, you know, just kind of the intersection of all, all the good stuff. But, um, but, you know, we're not, I'm not as prolific as you two. I mean, how many are you do a week? Three, four, five? Uh, we, we try to do at least three, sometimes five, sometimes six. It just depends on what, who schedules what. So, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm about once every 10 days. That's perfect. You know, so anyhow. Well, cool, man. I appreciate you having me. I hey, keep dude. talking. But, you know, you can keep me as long as you want. I know. Dave, we'll have you come back. We'll have to do something. 
Uh, so maybe we'll do one live from the Galliston fishing or something like that would be kind of. Yeah, fun. no, we're happy to do that. And, and specifically too, you know, uh, I'm happy to come on and, and talk to your folks really along the lines of litigation avoidance. Cause yeah. if you're in business, you don't want to be in litigation. And so, you know, maybe, you know, as the months go by and you see issues here, just make a little note of it. And, uh, that's the type of stuff I've just done so much. I could talk off the top of my head and tell you. I think that would be an awesome future yeah. episode. I think with, let's let's get it booked. I, I think it'd be a great idea. And That's if fun. you ever want to do something live where your your folks type in, I, I mean, you're I'd have to have you on there because I'll screw it up. Or the technology <laughs> part, but but have you know real live here kind of issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give you the legal disclaimer. Hey, I'm not your lawyer. Blah blah blah. But but I'm happy to give you you know, some, some real world advice in a real simple non legally stuff away. Here's what you need to do or don't do that. That's stupid. What, you know, and, 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 and try to help. Cause I try, I try to encourage people to self help as much as possible. Cause it helps you. It, it helps me, you yeah. know, if you act in a reasonable manner and, and, and document things in an appropriate and manner with whoever you have a dis potential dispute with and not only document it, but, you're reasonable well then if you can't get it worked out or resolved and then i get it what do i have i have a story to tell you have a story to tell about how reasonable you've been and you're getting screwed over by you know the by the fox and you know you're just trying to run your hen house and so um it it, it actually helps you in the long run yep i love it i think it's definitely a great idea we'll definitely do that so yeah absolutely uh, I've got to run, Jason. I know you do too, but thank you so much, guys. Reach, check out the Bird Chronicles. Uh, check out the Bird Law Firm, BYRD, out there out of Beaumont. Jace, thanks so much, buddy. Give my best to Jennifer, and uh, we'll see you later. All right, brother? Be good. I love you. All right, guys, it's going to wrap up for this episode. Go out, take some action, listen to what Jason said. He dropped some great nuggets on dealing with insurance companies, first and third party claims, and things like that. Read your policy, see what you're agreeing to, and what you do and don't have can make a big bang for the buck in the future. Uh, so quit trying to uh, save a nickel in the front. It can cost you a lot in the long run. So we'll see you guys all at the top, everybody. Bye.